Kevin Hart. Now, you know when Cat Williams said gatekeepers? Yes. Kevin Hart, mm -hmm. I do his um, podcast. Yes. Kevin Hart said, whatever we want to do, he got us. He's going to partner executive use. They was like, oh, this is incredible because when you put Kevin Hart's name on it, you already know what it is. Correct. We just got a call from Kevin Hart's manager, Dave Becky. And Dave Becky said, Kevin doesn't want anything to do with Monique. So whatever she told y'all, he doesn't want to do anything with her, nothing. You know, he doesn't want any any kind of relationship with Monique. Kevin Hart has been the talk of the town lately, with comedians like Cat Williams taking shots at him left and right. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, Monique joined the fray, spilling the tea on how it seems like he's dancing to the tune of the powers that be. So what exactly did she say? I didn't ask Kevin Hart to do anything. He said, I'll executive produce, I'll partner with you. I said, good shit, Kevin, because we're in a deal with Endemol. Monique prefaced her comments about Hart by admitting that he wrote a check to support her when she was down bad and that she would be forever grateful for it, though she made a point to say that she paid it back with interest. When the actress was a guest on Hart's podcast Comedy Gold Mines in 2021, he introduced her as an auntie, a mama, a spirit, and called her Mama Mo. She spoke on the podcast about Oprah Perry and Precious director Lee Daniels, who had not yet publicly apologized to her. Hart said he'd reach out to Perry to coordinate squashing the beef, to which Perry was allegedly not amenable. But she said Hart promised her he would execute produce and partner with her on whatever she was working on, which excited her because she and Hicks were working on a talk show deal. Hart's manager, Dave Becky, allegedly told Monique's production company that Hart wanted nothing to do with her. I called Kevin Hart immediately and told him, they said you didn't want to work with me, she said. He said, it's just a miscommunication. We're going to talk to Tuesday. That was two years ago. I've never talked to Kevin Hart again. That's what we're faced with. You allow someone to come between your relationship with a woman you said was like your mother. The hearts and parries aside, at one point, the Oscar-winning actress had a few words for The Breakfast Club. The tension between Monique and The Breakfast Club played out during a contentious 2018 interview on the Power 105.1 radio program. Earlier that year, Charlemagne the God gave the comedian the donkey of the day for promoting a boycott of Netflix over racial and gender bias. And then you give me a title of donkey of the day. Is your mother still alive? Yes, ma'am. And you're from what city in South Carolina? Monk's Corner, South Carolina. Monk's Corner. And if I was to call your mother or your grandmother, could they tell me stories of inequality? People were having call-ins when I said, this is not right. I was donkey of the day. Remember that? Monique asked Shannon Sharp on the Club Shay Shay podcast. Mo also said, the breakfast nubs called me the donkey of the day. That's what they said. And they had a whole call-in about how I was the donkey of the day. But you didn't do the same thing when you found out we settled. We gave Monique big love when the Netflix special happened. Charlemagne the God stated on the latest edition of The Breakfast Club. He also added, and I said, you know what? That's why I need to mind my damn business when it comes to other people business. In June 2022, then co-host Angela Yee covered Monique's finalized legal agreement with Netflix on The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God asked about the details of the settlement, but he did not comment further on the situation during that particular rumor report segment. Now, the weird thing about this is that Monique isn't the first person to expose Kevin Hart for allegedly being a power slave. You see, just a month ago, Cat Williams sat on the same seat on Club Shay Shay podcast talking about Kevin Hart. Williams began by highlighting the astonishing trajectory of Kevin Hart's career in Hollywood by first questioning the unprecedented speed with which Hart achieved success. In 15 years in Hollywood, no one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold-out Kevin Hart show, there being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any well, comedy club. Williams went on and suggested that Hart's rapid ascent was unusual and posed the question of whether Hart had truly paid his dues in the competitive world of stand-up comedy. The comedian emphasized the significance of the journey and questioned whether Hart's seemingly instant success was indicative of a different narrative. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to L.A. and in his first year in L.A. he had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called Soul Plane that he was leading? No. In the interview, Cat Williams introduced the term plant to describe someone who seemingly appears out of nowhere and attains success without the traditional struggles that comedians often face and then claims they are self-made. Williams then drew attention to the fact that Kevin Hart's documentary with Chris Rock revealed his comedy roots on the East Coast. He pointed to a perceived contradiction in Hart's narrative, noting, he just did his documentary with Chris Rock, where he shows you that his whole upbringing in comedy was on the East Coast. 
So how simultaneously was he here in Los Angeles doing the same thing? It didn't happen. Williams probed into the inconsistencies in Hart's story, challenging the widely accepted narrative of an overnight success. In any case, Kevin Hart also once addressed the rumors of his overnight success. In 2014, Kevin Hart sat down with Oprah for an interview on Oprah Prime, where he delved into the intricacies of his skyrocketing career and the harsh realities of finding success in Hollywood. Hollywood has a way of making everything seem like an overnight success, Hart explained during the interview. But I've had 18 years in the business. I put in my time. I got dues that have been paid and paid again and paid one more time after that. I stayed true to my dreams and eventually, they came true. Oprah pointed out the countless hardworking individuals striving to break into the industry and achieve success. She probed Hart on why he was able to do it while so many others faced insurmountable challenges. The difference in me is that I paid attention to what people did before me. Whether it was right or wrong, Hart reflected. Everybody that's successful lays a blueprint out. Not only did Hart pay attention, but even back in 2014, he surrounded himself with tangible reminders of those who paved the way for him, from Eddie Murphy to Chris Rock to Richard Pryor. The walls of his home adorned with pictures and paintings of comedians he considered mentors served as daily inspiration. I come down these steps every day, I look at Richard, he was great. I see Eddie, he was great. I see Chris Rock, he was great, Hart shared. It's a constant reminder. What am I trying to achieve? I want to be great. This unwavering motivation, as Hart expressed in the interview, was his belief in what set him apart in Hollywood. What separates me is my drive, he stated. My drive is other people's success. Anyway, Cat Williams didn't stop at questioning Kevin Hart's rapid rise. He also delved into the dynamics of Hollywood gatekeepers. Williams challenged the notion that there are no gatekeepers in the entertainment industry, asserting that he has observed individuals controlling access to opportunities. He used the example of Kevin Hart supposedly letting Tiffany Haddish into the industry, raising the question of whether gatekeepers do indeed exist. They tell you that there's no gatekeepers, but we keep seeing the same people open <laughs> Didn't Kevin open the <laughs> that Tiffany in? Ain't he now opening it up? Don't such a such. Cat Williams also addressed the issue of comedic standards during the interview. He explained that his refusal to compromise on certain content, specifically avoiding overtly homosexual themes, had led to him losing out on opportunities. Williams argued that he wasn't against humor, but advocated for a more thoughtful and considerate approach to comedy that didn't rely on outdated and potentially offensive tropes. You see, Cat has a long history of calling out Hollywood elites and their shady ways of controlling black celebrities. In a 2013 interview, with Black Tree TV while discussing his role in Scary Movie 5, Kat delved into some interesting topics, including a theory about black actors being forced to wear dresses on screen in order to progress to the next level of fame. It's worth noting that this interview came out not long after Kevin Hart appeared on an SNL skit wearing a dress. For context, it all started when Dave Chappelle, another revered comedian, appeared on Oprah's show in 2006 where he talked openly about his refusal to accept a $50 million deal from Comedy Central. He felt that such deals came with strings attached, and he was unwilling to be controlled or humiliated for the sake of a paycheck. Chappelle's revelations didn't end there. He recounted being asked to wear a dress for a movie scene, an experience that left him deeply uncomfortable. According to him, many comedians had faced similar situations, having to don dresses on screen, and it often coincided with a critical juncture in their careers. This too was a nod to the prevailing industry belief that black entertainers needed to cross this peculiar threshold to advance. Fast forward to 2012, when Kevin Hart was asked about Dave Chappelle's claims during a radio show. While he didn't explicitly say no to ever wearing a dress, Hart emphasized the importance of personal boundaries. He stated that crossing these boundaries was non-negotiable for him. You have to have you have to have boundaries, you have to have limits that you refuse to cross. He even cited examples of bizarre requests he had received, such as dribbling a basketball on a talk show, which he politely declined. Hart stressed the importance of protecting his brand and the potential risks of compromising it. However, just a year later, Hart appeared in an SNL skit where he donned a dress, a move that drew sharp criticism from fans. Some accused him of being a sellout, arguing that he had contradicted his earlier stance. The skit portrayed him as a nine-year-old child pope, an image that many believe didn't align with the Kevin heart they had come to know. The new Pope is nine-year-old Oscar nominee, Kevin Wallace.
Cat Williams seized this opportunity to reignite the feud. He suggested that Kevin Hart's actions on SNL were merely part of a larger pattern, insinuating that Hart was willingly playing by the industry's rules to secure fame and fortune. Williams opined that Hart's success allowed him to escape criticism for wearing a dress, as a long line of comedians had already done so before him. At the end of the day, Kevin doesn't have to worry about what people are going to say about him wearing a dress because of the long line of dress wearing people before him. He pointed to movies like Big Mama's House and the Medea franchise as examples of previous instances where comedians had donned dresses. Williams didn't go all out in his attack on Hart. Instead, he subtly questioned the choices made by comedians who aimed for mainstream success. In any case, Kevin Hart wasn't the only one on the receiving end of Monique's recent rant. She called out Oprah for allegedly seizing prominent roles that were initially offered to her following the Oscar controversy. For starters, Monique made it clear that she loves Oprah Winfrey. See, when I speak about Oprah Winfrey, and let me be clear, I love that sister. I speak about that woman because she's spoken about me. Monique prefaced her statements to host Shannon Sharp. And when you begin to speak about me privately, I'm going to speak about you publicly. In case you weren't aware, it all started in 2010, Monique said, when she won the Supporting Actress Oscar for her role in Lee Daniels' drama, Precious. That night, husband Sidney Hicks told her that Winfrey seemed bothered that the crowd was cheering for Monique instead of her. Winfrey was an executive producer on Precious. After that, Monique said, she started to notice that movie roles initially offered to her. Quoting Lee Daniels, she revealed, Lee Daniels came out and said, I did offer Monique the butler. But as he said to me, he said, Mo, at the time, I didn't have no power and I didn't have no money. Consequently, when Winfrey expressed interest, she ended up portraying the lead character in The Butler. Expanding on the issue, Monique pointed out a similar occurrence with an unreleased biopic about Richard Pryor. Lee Daines was getting ready to do a biopic on Richard Pryor, and he offered me the grandmother. Who then calls Lee Daniels and says, I want to be the grandmother. This pattern of events underscored Monique's frustration and raised questions about industry dynamics and power imbalances. Despite reconciling with Daniels in 2022, Monique emphasized her demand for an apology from Winfrey during the podcast. She insisted that Winfrey and Perry should join the conversation to address her grievances directly. You've been unfair, you've been unjust, and you watched the black woman be thrown under the bus and you said nothing, Monique expressed, highlighting her disappointment with Winfrey's actions and inactions. In addition to her personal concerns, Monique emphasized a broader sense of disappointment for the community. I'm not hurt personally, I'm hurt for our community, she emphasized, signaling that her grievances extended beyond her own experiences to systemic issues affecting marginalized voices in the entertainment industry. This sentiment illuminated the deeper societal implications of the alleged injustices Monique faced. Monique also addressed the drama regarding her family's appearance on The Oprah Winfrey Show in 2010. It was a month after Monique won the Oscar for Precious when Oprah had Monique's brother on her talk show. Monique had been vocal about how her brother, Gerald Imes, had essayed her when she was a child. In her interview with Sharp, Monique said that Oprah did call her to ask if it was okay to have him on the show. Your brother wants to come on the show and he wants to apologize to you for A-being you, and he wants to tell other people how to look out for predators, Monique recounted Oprah saying. According to Monique, she told Oprah she wanted nothing to do with him, but that she should still do the show, in case her brother had become a different person. At the time, she was grateful that Oprah had reached out. I start seeing commercials with my mother and my father and my other brother, who used to be my manager, who knew the fear that I had of the brother that was up on stage, Monique recalled to Sharp. Monique claimed that Oprah did not tell her that her other family members would be on the show. Monique said that she eventually confronted Winfrey at a party, and said Winfrey apologized apologized and claimed that Monique's family showed up on the day unexpectedly. Monique also told the Club Shay Shay podcast that her family also called the former The View co-host Barbara Walters to appear on the talk show before they spoke to Winfrey, but Walters rejected them. She said, Monique, I told your family I can't do that to you. I wouldn't do that to you. You just won that award. Why would I do that? Monique said of Walters, who died in December 2022. Monique added that she would have shut down the Oprah interview if she knew her mother would be involved. We never talked about my mother being there, Monique said. Oprah and I had a private conversation about our mothers. This is the part people don't know. I shared with Oprah Winfrey what we were going through and how I felt, she added. But you don't tell me you have my mother and my father on your show, and you think that that's just okay?
In any case, Monique would soon begin to feel the effects of speaking up against Hollywood elites. Soon, there was a pattern that felt like a coordinated effort to blackball her from Hollywood, an effort she suspected was spearheaded by Winfrey and Tyler Perry, who later admitted to Monique that he had started a rumor that she was difficult to work with. Unbeknownst to Perry, Monique said, she had recorded his confession, but when she showed it to people, she said they were more troubled by her unauthorized recording than by Perry's behavior. How does a black woman win when you say, here he is right here? And I look to the community and say, how long do we allow us to keep being exploited, used up, taken advantage of because we think somebody can give us an opportunity? She asked Sharp. If we keep operating like that, Shannon, you're going to have a whole lot of us sitting right here in the same seat almost telling the same story. She clarified that the recording was legally obtained according to the state's laws. Despite this revelation, Monique noted that Lee Daniels stood out as the only individual who offered an apology for the turmoil she endured. Furthermore, Daniels had even extended an olive branch by casting her in his upcoming horror film, The Deliverance. See, that's a friend. Mm -hmm. That's a true friend that's saying, I love you so much that I want to make sure that's not on your heart or your conscience. Let's fix it. Let's make it right. Nevertheless, the damaging rumors propagated by Perry and others had a profound impact on Monique's career trajectory. She lamented, if I were a white woman, my name would be Melissa McCarthy, pointing out the stark contrast in opportunities between her and the prolific white actress who seemingly lands new comedy projects with regularity. The disparity in opportunities left Monique's interviewer, Sharp, visibly stunned and speechless. Monique proceeded to shed light on the financial injustices she faced, particularly in relation to her work on the sitcom The Parkers. Despite starring in 110 episodes of the show, which reportedly generated a staggering $800 million in revenue between 2004 and 2009, Monique revealed that she never received any compensation. She likened this apparent lack of financial transparency to the dubious accounting practices that often leave successful projects like Men in Black in perpetual financial deficits. The injustice continued as Monique recounted a recent incident involving her former co-star Countess Vaughn, who was reportedly being convinced by unnamed parties that the Parkers had not generated any profits. This revelation highlighted the ongoing struggle for fair compensation and transparency within the entertainment industry, particularly for black artists like Monique, who have historically faced systemic barriers and discrimination. In any case, this is not the first time that Mo has called out these elites. In an emotionally charged and unfiltered interview with T.S. Madison, Monique bared her soul, revealing the intricate webs of power dynamics and systemic challenges she faced in Hollywood. The conversation unfolded with Monique recounting a pivotal exchange with Tyler Perry, a towering figure in the film industry. She vividly painted the scene, describing how Perry allegedly attempted to coerce her into campaigning for an award nomination without any contractual obligations. Monique's recollection of Perry's words was chilling. You may want to campaign for this because if you get nominated, your next film will be three to five million dollars. In response, Monique's defiance was palpable. I said, Tyler, look at me. I'm a black woman. Where they do that at? Those aren't the, sal the salaries that we're going to get. Her refusal to bow down to Perry's expectations highlighted the stark disparities in opportunities and compensation faced by black women in Hollywood. Monique's unwavering stance underscored her commitment to principles of fairness and equity in an industry rife with inequality. As the interview progressed, Monique delved deeper into the fallout from her refusal to comply with Perry's demands. She spoke candidly about being labeled as difficult to work with, a characterization she vehemently refuted. Monique revealed instances where both Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey allegedly contributed to perpetuating this narrative, despite evidence to the contrary. Now here comes the black ball, Monique declared. She's difficult to work with. Her and her husband, they are difficult people, so now nobody's going to touch Monique because Oprah Winfrey said nothing. The repercussions of being branded as difficult reverberated throughout Monique's career, impacting her opportunities and professional relationships. Despite her undeniable talent and contributions to the industry, Monique found herself marginalized and sidelined, a casualty of systemic discrimination and bias. In a pivotal moment during her interview with T.S. Madison, Monique shared the reactions of prominent figures upon hearing a tape recording that seemed vindicated her claims against Tyler Perry. The responses from Al Sharpton and Kevin Hart shed light on the complexities surrounding Monique's ordeal, offering insights into the dynamics of power and accountability within the entertainment industry. When Al Sharpton heard the tape, Monique recounted his immediate condemnation of Tyler Perry's actions. That man is wrong, and you're like my daughter, so I'm going to have to call him up. 
Sharpton's response underscored a sense of familial loyalty and a recognition of the injustice inflicted upon Monique. His willingness to confront Perry on her behalf exemplified a form of allyship and solidarity crucial in navigating the challenges faced by black women in Hollywood. However, the situation took a surprising turn when Perry seemingly changed his stance after further discussions. Monique recounted the sequence of events. He called back while we were on the phone and said, no, I changed my mind. I will meet with Monique, but not with her husband. And then she has to apologize to me and Oprah Winfrey for saying that we had anything to do with ruining her career. This abrupt shift in Perry's position left Monique baffled and questioning the sincerity of his intentions. The demand for an apology added another layer of complexity to an already fraught situation, further complicating efforts to reconcile and move forward. Monique drew poignant parallels between her experience and those of other trailblazing black women who face similar backlash for speaking out against injustices. With reverence, she invoked the names of Eartha Kitt, Hazel Scott, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Hattie McDaniel, all of whom dared to defy the status quo and suffered the consequences. Oftentimes, when it comes to a black woman speaking up and speaking out, it goes unheard until she dies, Monique lamented. Then once she dies, then we go back and say, well, she was right and let's make a movie about it. In any case, it seems like these Hollywood elites just won't quit with their blackballing antics against actors. The poor souls caught in their crosshairs need a knight in shining armor to step up, speak out, and offer them some alternative opportunities. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.